strange To filled her through this land of ours And fill a sportsman's dreams Enjoy what nature holds for us Her bounty never ends Getting back to basics With the practical sportsman It's always an adventure No matter where we go From a favorite hunting spot To the hottest fishing hole Outdoor life we all can share with family and friends We'll do it all together with a practical sportsman And we'll do it all together with a practical sportsman Hi there, come on in. It is Thursday, August 29th, the year 2002. Summer's over. It's going to start getting colder now. Which brings up a question, Zach. You mentioned a few weeks ago on the outdoor news that uh, people were catching piranha in right. places in Michigan. Are they going to be able to survive the winter? Well, not overall, but you know, there's always that chance. There's always that chance, and that's what we're going to talk about on this show. Can piranha make it through the winter? There's some evidence they can. You stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. And I'm Zachary Trost. And you're watching The Practical Sportsman. the Michigan Outdoor News. Uh, this is a publication that we're really excited about because of uh, all the information and opinions in here. That's a great publication. Yeah, Ted Nugent uh, writes a column. Uh, Jim Goodhart used to be uh, the executive director of MUCC. So a lot of interesting things. Uh, and you, of course, do our outdoor headlines, our Michigan Outdoor News, from this publication. So how about launching into the news for this week? No problem. Dateline Fayette. Teresa Lee landed a state record splake off of a dock at Fayette State Historical Park, which is on Big Bay Dinoc in the Upper Peninsula. The splake weighed 17.44 pounds and was 33 inches long. It fought for a half hour on eight pound test line. Teresa and her husband Kevin own Salmar Fishing Resort and Charters on the shores of Little Bay Dinoc in Delta County. For more information on the Michigan Outdoor News, Check out our website at practicalsportsman.org. Interesting stuff, Zach. It is. And But I want to go back to something that you had a couple weeks ago about uh, people catching piranha in Glover's Lake. Right. And people say they can't live in the winter. And that's not... I mean, there's possibilities. It, what if they're near a power plant that's discharging warm water? That's right. They can't survive the cold water. Doesn't mean they can't live through the winter. That they can't find some warm enough yes. water. I want to show you something. You were in Florida when I put this on the air, but this is about piranhas and their ability to possibly survive through the winter. Take a look at this, Zach. It's about these uh, tropical fish that may be able to live in Michigan. In Michigan, there are over 50 species of fish that can be caught and entered into the DNR's Master Angler program. Now, a few Michigan fish like pike and muskie have sharp teeth, but these jaws aren't nearly as dangerous as the teeth on a fish that Ryan Wynn brought to our fishing awards banquet in 1998. Now, we have a strange thing here that we have to, we have to add a species. Hold that up there, let the people at home look at that and see if they recognize what that is. This is kind of a spooky fish to, uh, to haul out of a Michigan lake. What, what lake was this? This is a local gravel pit. Local gravel pit where there's somebody in the area who has a rather twisted sense of humor. What kind of fish is this? This is a black piranha. Very nice. Do many people swim in that gravel pit? Not that I know of. <laughs> Ah, uh, that's weird. Look at that, the mouth on that baby. I, you know, they don't have apparently tremendous teeth, but I guess they can just rip the flesh right off your bones. Yeah. So uh, somebody must have planted this in there, huh? Yeah, it probably got too big for their aquarium and just dumped it in. Very nice. You know, these things, do you suppose they live through the winter? Probably just dumped it in the, in the spring and then I caught it in about June. Hmm. Piranha come from the tropics of South America. Now we all know the tropical fish require very warm water to survive, or, or do they? So you called me on the phone, Sparky, to give me some uh, shocking news 
about our conclusion that piranha will not live in cold water in Michigan. I wasn't meant to be shocking. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, you know, just from personal experience and watching these guys and seeing what these guys have been through, uh, I've changed my mind from uh, all the authors as to whether or not they could possibly survive. Sparky Miller from Sturgis has been raising and studying piranhas for 12 years. At one time, he had seven large tanks of breeding piranhas which only spawned when the water was kept very warm. I asked Sparky if he thought there was any chance a piranha released into Michigan waters could reproduce. Everything that I read and was told and uh, could find and lay my hands on stated that the water had to be 84, 86 degrees and uh, had to be uh, a certain pH more on the acid side in order for them to spawn. But a couple years ago, uh, two of these, these two underneath the big one, uh, are a result of uh, my attempts at keeping them from spawning by keeping the water at 72 and it looked like they were spawning. Nah, too cold. Book says it can't. Several weeks later, a little fish in there. Hmm. Well, that was at 72 degrees. I'm not no fancy expert. I haven't traveled to the Amazon. I just uh, believe what I see. Sparky Miller now believes it would be possible for a piranha to spawn in a warm water lake in Michigan. But even if a piranha could spawn, I asked Sparky if he thought there was any way he thought it could survive the winter. As of about three years ago, I would have said no. But uh, in the last three years, uh, moving to a new location and uh, not having room in the house for the, all the tanks, I put them in a shed. And uh, not being there all the time, occasionally have a breaker trip, power fails. In the wintertime, it's... Uh, it just happens in the evening after you've last checked on them. Next morning you get out there and the tanks are iced over and uh, your rest of your collection is all dead. These guys are still swimming. Not fast, but they were still swimming. To help keep the tank clean, we had uh, a fish called a Plecostomus. So it looks like a ugly catfish, if you will. He was dead. Hmm. And, uh, the first uh, freeze over, this uh, big guy's buddy and one of his uh, offspring died in that. And then uh, in subsequent, uh, they, the tanks froze three more times, or two more times, at a total of three freezes. And uh, the one biggest tank was ruined as a result of it. And uh, can they live in Michigan? I believe it is possible. Uh, they're still alive. These piranha are the only ones left from seven large tanks of breeders that Sparky maintained. Now, not every piranha can spawn at 72 degrees, and not every piranha can survive freezing temperatures. Perhaps the piranha we're looking at right now are aberrations in the fish world that could only have survived in Sparky Miller's tanks and not have survived in the wild. It's possible. It's possible that these have just simply been toughened by their experiences. Mm -hmm. But never, ever sell short the ability of God's creatures to adapt themselves to their surroundings that they find themselves in and prosper therein. What about the characteristics of piranha? Of course, everybody wondered about Ryan's story of people swimming in that gravel pit when there were piranhas there. Are these fish right here dangerous if you stuck your hand down in the tank? Oh, they haven't been in the past. Oh, great. Come on, guys. Over here. Well, you mentioned to me on the phone that... Yeah, I just touched him. ...that you have been cut by them. I've been cut by them because when uh, you move from one end of the tank to the other, they kind of uh, wait for you to finish at one end of the tank. They wait for you to finish, and then they go to the other while you finish cleaning the other end of the tank. Well, one of them ripped by my uh, hand, and about a three-quarter inch long gash, and uh, 
just looked like somebody had carefully taken a razor blade and just uh, if you ever cut your hand with a razor blade you'll notice that you can just peel back a little layer of skin just like that and uh, that's all there was to it so even though they're but, territorial uh, they aren't they, they obviously aren't attacking you because your hand is in there no now uh, I would venture to say it'd probably be different if they were starved if they were starved it would it would be different but uh, As long as they're well fed, they're not interested in attacking anything. Hmm. Do they attack each other? They do at times. Uh, it seems like uh, sometimes they are more of a threat to each other than anything else. Do they ever fight? I mean, take bites out of each other? Yes, they have. They, they do get into fights when uh, one wants to enlarge his uh, elbow room and the other one won't have anything of it. Uh, uh, what is odd about the piranha is uh, one can take a bite out of another and uh, it heals back over and fills in and a couple months later you can't tell where he's been bitten. Hmm. This big guy, he's, he's had several bites taken out of him between the upper fin and the tail but uh, you wouldn't be able to tell that now. And as far as taking a, a chunk out of each other's fin for about a month and a half, it'll fill in, but it'll be a different color. Four months later, it's all the same color. Hmm. Where do piranha come from? Where, what's the native water of these critters right yeah. here? Anything that dumps into the Amazon River in uh, South America. But, uh, that's the only place they're native. What do they eat in the Amazon? Do Generally really fish, uh, fish and carrion. You mean dead stuff laying in the water? Yes, uh, they're somewhat of nature's cleanup crew down there. I mean, uh, when the rainy season is on, uh, the Amazon River uh, floods uh, a good 40 feet at times, and which kills a lot of wildlife. And is your cleanup crew? Hmm. But uh, they have been known to uh, embark on a eating frenzy. Mm hmm. On something live. On something live. But uh, I would say they have to be very hungry before they've done that. And uh, in places where they were trapped by the receding river in backwaters, then uh, it gets down to where there's nothing there but piranhas, and they're going to feast on each other for a while. And if something else steps in the way, uh, it's a change of diet. Hmm. When they eat a larger fish like that, do they eat it whole or do they tear it apart? How, what they, it just, uh, they just take out bite-sized chunks and uh, they're just uh, kind of getting up on it and each takes a bite and goes about their business. Do, do you think they'd eat if you dropped a crawler in there? But your experience tell they you? They might. They might. Here it goes, a juicy crawler. Now the big guy, if he's in the mood for eating, he can stash five or six of them at one setting. Right now, uh, it appears they're still worried about our presence. Although they did come up initially and look at it. There we go. Ooh. Right now the crawler is apparently just an intruder. Kind of a boring fish, really, isn't it? Boring, you know, uh, it would be except for the teeth. Except for the teeth. Boy, the way they're working, and, and it doesn't appear that they can, maybe they can close their mouth all the way, can they? Not really. They, uh, in uh, normal breathing, they don't close their mouth all the way. You'll see their tongue come up and touch the roof of their mouth. Uh, when they do take a bite, the, uh, the teeth do 
mesh. So there are teeth on the top. I didn't. Oh yes. Oh yes. There's teeth on the top. I didn't see them. You just see that uh, bottom row. Now the bottom row is what kind of sticks out at you. Yes, isn't it? it does. <laughs> but uh, they do have teeth in the top uh, in uh, dried versions that you can buy as souvenirs in South America. They peel the top lip off so you can see the top teeth. Hmm. And uh, if you look closely and uh, somewhat up, you can see that they do have teeth on the top, and uh, they just uh, the lip just kind of hmm. covers over it. But these are the, the, the end of the piranhas. You say you're not going to breed anymore. Have you, you've bred them then in the past? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, this, I'm not going to breed anymore because uh, if they can survive, uh, if they can survive being iced in, uh, then I feel that they can survive in the wild. And uh, given a uh, shallow area, summertime, uh, I believe it's possible for them to spawn. And uh, I don't want to scare anybody, but uh, if they do spawn and have a nest in a shallow area, all fish protect their territory. And uh, this guy has got excellent enforcement gear in his mouth. So, uh, I don't know how to put it. It just might not be worth messing with, is what you're saying. What, uh, well, you know, you got to ask yourself sooner or later, uh, do you want to contribute to the spread of something that could survive in this area? And uh, I would urge everybody to uh, don't just dump them. Find somebody to take them off your hands, but don't just dump them in a body of water. Please. I believe they can survive. These and you still alive. And you must also believe that they could be dangerous then. There is a possibility of it. There is a possibility. If you found this story disturbing, I'm sorry. I mean, I wish I could say the piranhas will never become established in Michigan. And if they do, I wish I could say that they'd never attack a human being, but I can't say that. Last October, someone sent me an article from the Muskegon Chronicle. Check out this fish. Big, jagged, sharp teeth on the bottom jaw. That's a piranha. The article said, John Quincy Allen Jr., a longtime Muskegon fisherman, pulled in a five pound, 17 and 5 eighths inch fish Tuesday morning that many believe is a piranha. Now, it was confirmed as a piranha, and it was also confirmed as much larger than the average piranha. Most piranhas are eight to 10 inches. Based on what we learned from Sparky Miller's experience with his fish in captivity, let me show you a couple of distressing quotes from this Muskegon Chronicle article. It said, the fish was caught at the end of Muskegon Lake near the hot water discharge for the BC Cobb plant. Now, DNR fisheries biologist Jay Wesley was quoted as saying, it's possible near a warm water discharge that it could have lived a few years. Whoa, that's long enough for the piranha to find another piranha and start producing more piranhas. Well, let's read on. As unusual as Allen's catch was, it might not have been the only piranha taken out of Muskegon Lake this year. Sam Billups, another area angler, reported catching a smaller version over Labor Day weekend. And there was another unconfirmed report of a piranha being caught last Saturday near the warm water discharge. Now, do you see a pattern here? That's three piranha caught. Now, how many more are out there that didn't get caught? Now, the final distressing quote in this article was one I have not checked out with the DNR, but it should be investigated. The article said, and I quote, while the DNR gets occasional reports of piranha biting swimmers in northern water, the fish are far more, far more likely to attack other fish. Now, I was not aware that piranha have ever attacked swimmers in North America. Maybe there's something more we should know. What do you think? Another month? Another summer shot. Gone. <laughs> Gone. It's behind us. There's lots to do coming up, though, and we start our new TV season here in a couple weeks. Looking forward to that. And get outdoors this weekend if you can. It's a great place to be. See you next week. In, uh, in places where they were trapped by the receding river in backwaters, then uh, 
it gets down to where there's nothing there but piranhas and they're going to feast on each other for a while and if something else steps in the way, uh, it's a change of diet. Hmm. When they eat a larger fish like that, do they eat it whole or do they tear it apart? How, what they, it just, uh, they just take out bite-sized chunks and uh, they're just uh, kind of getting up on it. And each takes a bite, goes about their business.